Hello everyone, welcome to the class. Today we will discuss a very important communication technology that is uh, coming in every application today and that is OFDM. The title of today's lecture is DFT and its application in OFDM because we will specially see how a such a simple transform technique as DFT plays how important role in the OFDM technology. Before going into the OFDM technology, we will first discuss the basics of uh, the DFT transform and even before that we will discuss some uh, basic results in signals and systems because those basic results are very fundamental in understanding the DF, uh, OFDM technology based on DFT. So, we will consider a discrete time version of the channel, the transmitted signal and the received signal. The whole system will be in discrete time and we will denote a discrete time signal as a sequence like this, where this is the 0th sample, this is the minus 1 sample, this is uh, sample number minus 2 and on this side sample number 1, 2 and so on. We will consider real signal as well as complex signal. So, sometimes the, the signal may be real or complex. Uh, if the signal is real, all these sample values are real. If it is complex, all these samples are complex numbers. Okay. Uh, example of a real sequence is this, where this starts from 0, the 0 uh, sample onwards. Before that, all the samples are 0 in this particular example. And the plot of this signal is like this. Such a signal will be plotted on the real axis at integer uh, values on x axis. So, this is the 0th sample, the value, value is 4 and the first sample is of magnitude 2 and so on. And for any given discrete time signal, the discrete time Fourier transform is defined as this, this is a function of omega, the angular frequency and uh, on this side there is a summation over all time instances, that is uh, integer valued time instances, because this is a discrete time signal. And one can note that even if x k, the, the this x n is also sometimes denoted by x subscript n. So, here that is the notation that is used. Uh, we will use both the notations interchangeably to mean the same thing. So, this is the kth sample of the uh, discrete time signal and this is the DTFT of the signal. And we see that even if x k is real, the signal is real, its DTFT may be complex because this quantity is complex. So, the DTFT of a signal is complex in general, even if the signal is real valued. And for plotting the DTFT, since it is complex, we can plot it in either of the two ways, either to plot the magnitude and phase separately or to plot the real and imaginary parts separately. For example, consider the Kronecker delta function, this signal delta n is 1 at n equal to 0 and 0 in all the other times. So, there is only one time instance n equal to 0, where the signal has non-zero value. In all other n, the value is 0. DT of t of this signal is obviously 1, because for k not equal to 0, all these x k's are 0 and only for k equal to 0, we have x 0, then e to the power 0, which is 1. So, and x 0 is 1, so we have 1. So, for any omega, this side is 1. So, DTFT of the Kronecker delta signal is 1. So, the magnitude is 1 and phase is 0 for all omega. Let us take another example. 3 times delta n minus delta n minus 1. So, which basically means that the magnitude of the signal at n equal to 0 is 3 and at n equal to 1 the magnitude is minus 1 
and at all other n the magnitude is 0. So, uh, DTFT of this signal is obviously the DTFT of this minus DTFT of this because DTFT is linear. So, DTFT of this is 3 times 1 that is 3 minus the DTFT of this is e to the power minus j omega because this is the shifted uh, delta function shifted by 1. So, it will be the DTFT of delta n times e to the power minus j omega. So, we can we can manipulate this and see that this is nothing but 3 minus cos omega plus j times sin omega. This is the real part and this is the imaginary part. And we can compute the magnitude of this DTFT as the square of this plus square of sin omega and then root over the whole thing. This is the magnitude of the DTFT that is this. And the phase is the tan inverse imaginary part by the real part. Okay. So, we can compute the uh, magnitude and the phase of the DTFT this way and we can plot the magnitude and the phase from those expressions. So, the for that example this is the these are the plots. Now, if the DFT of a signal is given we can also compute the signal back from the DTFT. If the DTFT is given we can compute the signal back from the DTFT. So, the, the formula for that is this the DTFT is x e to the power j omega and the signal at n can be obtained from the DTFT from this integral. And one uh, property of DTFT is that it is periodic with period 2 pi. So, the integration you can see is from minus pi to pi because outside that it repeats this quantity repeats. So, there is no extra information there and uh, so the DTFT is periodic with period 2 pi. Uh, of course, we have to keep in mind that the definition of DTFT may not converge and we will not discuss those convergence issues in detail here. We will assume that for all practical signals um, are uh, all practical signals that we will consider are uh, nice enough and DTFT uh, exists. Okay. Uh, linearity as we mentioned DTFT is linear that means, if there are two signals x n and y n and their DTFTs are x e to the power j omega and y e to the power j omega respectively, then for any two complex numbers a and b a x n plus b y n is another signal and DTFT of that signal will be a times x e to the power j omega plus b times y e to the power j omega. So, the same linear combination of the DTFT will be the DTFT of the linear combination. So, this is the linearity and then another important property is convolution. When you convolve two signals in the time domain, the DTFT is multiplied in the frequency domain. So, if you convert if you do convolution in the time domain in the frequency domain the DTFTs are multiplied. So, if z n is x n convolution y n then the uh, DTFT of z n will be x to the power j omega times y to the power j omega. And uh, just the converse of that is that if you instead take product of the two signals in time domain that is sample wise product that is z 0 is x 0 times y 0, z 1 is x 1 times y 1 and so on that is z n is x n times y n for any n. Then in the frequency domain the signals are uh, convoluted and one can see from this expression that this is really the convolution of these two. Basically, this is the cyclic convolution of these two because this x and y are periodic. We will not elaborate and prove these results here, we will just discuss them in brief. So, so as to remind you, I am sure all of you know it, but in case uh, you have forgotten, please go back and look at any signal processing book or signals and systems book, this will be there. Now, 
let us consider DFT. DFT is uh, basically a sampled version of the DTFT in frequency domain. We have the DTFT which is periodic in 0 to 2 pi, it is periodic with period 2 pi. We sample the DTFT, uh, we take m number of sam samples equally spaced in frequency, then that becomes our m point DFT. The DFT is discrete in frequency domain also. The DTFT was taken off a discrete time signal, but the DTFT itself was in continuous frequency. In the time domain, the signal was uh, in discrete time, but in frequency domain, the transform was in continuous frequency. Whereas, the DFT is taken of a discrete time signal and the DFT itself is in discrete frequency. The transform itself has uh, finite number of components, m number of components. And the formula for DFT is the x k, see that there is no omega now, because the frequency domain is also discretized. So, the kth component of the DFT is obtained by taking the uh, DTFT of the signal at this frequency 2 pi k by m. So, that is 2 pi is divided into m parts by taking 2 pi by m and then multiplied by k. So, for a k equal to 0, 1, 2 till m minus 1, we get uh, some samples of the frequency in 0 to 2 pi. And when you write it down in terms of the time domain signal from the formula of DTFT, we get this. And this is the well known DFT formula. And the inverse DFT can be written in this form and the inverse will be same as the time domain signal that we started with provided that the original signal itself had at most m number of samples, m number of non-zero samples. If the original signal had more than m samples and we took DTFT of that signal and took m samples of the DTFT, then we cannot get the original signal back from those m samples, because the time domain signal had more than m components and we have taken only m number of components in the frequency domain. We cannot get those more than m samples in the time domain back from the m samples in the frequency domain that we have taken. So, for being able to recover the time domain signal from the frequency domain samples, the original signal itself should have less than equal to m number of samples. So, uh, DFT is actually defined for uh, m length sequences, whose number of non-zero components uh, conjugative uh, components are uh, is m. So, we have an m length sequence x n, we will assume that the length is m and that is x n is 0 from uh, for n less than 0 and n greater than m minus 1, that is for n equal to 0 to m minus 1 only the value can be non-zero. Then we have this inverse DFT that we can get x n back from x i using this formula. Okay. So, from now on we will assume that x n is 0 for n less than 0 and n greater than m minus 1. Okay. So, now from the formula we can also write DFT in the following way. If we define a matrix D as this that is 1 by root over m times the first row is 1 1 1 all 1s, second row is 1 e to the power minus j 2 pi by m e to the power minus j 4 pi by m and so on that is 2 pi by m times k where k is varying from 0 1 2 and so on. Then 2 pi times 2 times k where k is varying from 0 1 2 and so on. So, all these are multiple of 4 pi you can see above in the numerator and then the next will be all will be multiple of 6 pi and so on. Here all are multiple of m minus 1 times uh, 2 m minus 1 times pi. So, once we have this matrix and we denote the 
time domain time domain sequence as a vector because it now has only m number of non-zero components. We can write only those non-zero components and we do not need to write the zeros outside that range. So, we have a vector representation of the sequence x 0 to x m minus 1 and the d f t has also m, m components written as x 0 to x m minus 1. Then this vector can be expressed in terms of this vector as x equal to this x multiplied by this matrix d. So, d f t of the time domain vector x is obtained simply by taking by multiplying this matrix to the time domain vector. This is the time domain vector and this is the d f t vector. We can also call it the frequency domain vector. So, the d f t is obtained by simply multiplying by this matrix d and so the this matrix d is called the d f t matrix and this can be taken as an equivalent definition of d f t. Okay. And then i d f t is obviously written in terms of d in a very simple manner as x equal to capital X times d inverse. How do we get this vector back from d uh, back from this x d f t? We simply multiply by d inverse from the right and then we get on the right hand side simply simply small x and on the right left hand side we get capital X times d inverse. So, small x is equal to capital X times d inverse that is the inverse d f t formula. Previously, we had it written in terms of uh, summation like this and this is now expressed as this and the matrix d inverse is also very similar to matrix d. Instead of this matrix, we now have the same matrix except for these minus signs. These are minus signs here whereas, this has no minus sign on these exponentials. Otherwise, the matrix is same. So, this is quite uh, quite clear also from the corresponding definitions in terms of summations. In the definition of d f t we have minus here, in the definition of inverse d f t we do not have this minus otherwise the formulas are same. Okay. So, we have defined d f t and i d f t. The properties of d f t and i d f t are also very similar to the properties of the d t f t because they are the sampled version of the uh, d t f t. It also has sat, uh, satisfies linearity, it satisfies a similar uh, property like convolution, similar property like modulation and let us just go through them one by one. Linearity, if we take two vectors, we take a linear combination of them A and B are two scalars, then the d f t of that vector is a times d f t of x plus b times d f t of y. So, the d f t is linear. Then uh, cyclic convolution, in the case of d t f t we had linear convolution in the time domain, uh, then that meant uh, point wise multiplication in the frequency domain, whereas here in the time domain we need to take cyclic convolution. Cyclic convolution is defined in this way. Uh, z is the cyclic convolution of x and y, then z k is defined as this for k equal to 0 to m minus 1. And this z is still an m length vector unlike the linear convolution. So, uh, that is because this y k minus 1, this k minus 1 is also taken modulo m. So, if it is greater than an m, only the residue after dividing by m is taken here. So, if we take the cyclic convolution this way, then the d f t of this vector, the cyclic convolution will be simply point wise product of the d f t of x and y. So, that is the d f t of this cyclic convolution of x and y, if we call that capital Z, then Z i will be x i times y i, the point wise product of the d f t components of x and y. Okay. Then, in the time domain if we take point wise product, that is if we take a vector z such that z i, the ith component is the product of the ith components of x and y, then the d f t of z will be the cyclic convolution of the corresponding d f t's of x and y. So, 
cyclic convolution in the time domain will mean point wise product in the frequency domain, whereas the point wise product in the time domain will mean cyclic convolution in the frequency domain. And then cyclic shift, this is actually a special case of the convolution. Uh, if we have a sequence x, a vector x and we cyclically shift this vector, then so y i is x i minus 1 that is this x vector is cyclically shifted towards left. So, y 1 is equal to x 2, y 2 is x 3 and so on. So, x vector is cyclically shifted towards left to get the y vector. Y vector is nothing but the left y cyclically shift of uh, x vector. So, if we do that then the d f t of y has a relation with the d f t of x and that relation is also very simple. It is simply that the kth d f t component is the kth d f t component of x times this factor. Okay. Now, let us just have uh, revised the graphical representation of the linear convolution and cyclic convolution. Graphically, the convolution is simply the four operations together. That is, first we flip one of the vectors, then shift that flipped vector, then multiply that vector with the other vector with which we are taking the convolution, then add all the components of the resulting vector. That will give us one component of the convolution. So, if you want to take linear convolution of x and y sequences, x k is one sequence and y k are y another sequence, then let us say we choose y k and flip that sequence y k, we get y minus k sequence that is the flipped version of y k sequence. Then we shift this sequence by n. So, if we want to compute the linear convolution at time n, then we shift the flipped sequence y by n. So, we get y n minus k. Then we multiply this by the x sequence x k times this. So, k is the running variable here and n is fixed. We want to compute the convolution at n. So, n is fixed and k is running. So, x k times y n minus k is what we obtain after multiplying by the shifted and flipped y k with the x sequence. Okay. So, after that we, we add all the components of this product sequence. So, for different k we have different values, different samples of this sequence. We add all the components and we get summation over k of this and that is our z n the convolution of x and y. And uh, we know that the length of the convolution of two sequences, linear convolution of two sequences is the length sum of the lengths of the individual sequences minus 1. So, length of the convolution of x and y is length of x plus length of y minus 1. Let us see an example. This is a sequence x, it has four non-zero samples 0 to 3. So, the length is 4. Another sequence is y n has length 2 0 to 1 and we want to take convolution of these two sequences. We can do it by graphical method, uh, but of course, for this case it is simpler to do it by using linearity of convolution. So, this is this plus this and we take convolution of x n with delta n and convolution of x n with delta n minus 1 and take the linear combination given by this. So, it is x n convolution delta n minus 2 times x n convolution delta n minus 1. Now, what is x n convolution delta n? It is x n itself and what is x n convolution delta n minus 1? It is x n minus 1. It will be shifted by 1. So, it is x n minus 2 times x n minus 1 and that can be simply computed as this. 
and the length becomes 5 0 to 4 5 0 1 2 3 4 and length should be 5 because the length of this is 4 and length of this is 2. So, 2 plus uh, 4 minus 1 that is 6 minus 1 that is 5. So, the uh, this is how we can compute the convolution here. Okay. So, graphical method also let us just see the graphical method how to do it by the graphical method because that will give us some insight into the convolution um, um, into convolution. So, we have x n if we plot x n we have 2 at 0 at 1 we have the value 3 at 1 we have value 3 at 2 we have value 1 and at at 3 the value is minus 1 okay so this is n this is 0 1 2 so, this is x n and y n is at n equal to 0 it is 1 and n equal to 1 it is minus 2. Okay, so, from the graphical method, how should we compute the linear convolution? Let us take y n. Let us suppose we want to compute the convolution at n equal to uh, 3. So, at n equal to 3, the value should be minus 3. We want to get this value. How do we do it graphically? We first flip this sequence y n. We, we shift this, we flip this sequence y n we get from here at 0 we have value 1 at minus 1 we have value minus 2 at all other values it is 0. So, this is our y minus n instead of n we will denote it by k as we have denoted in the uh, slide. So, let us call the running variable k. Okay. So, this is minus 2, this is 1. Then we shift it by 3 because we want to compute the convolution at n equal to 3. So, we shift it towards right by 3. So, we shift it by 3 to get. So, from here we get So, this minus 1 will go to 2. So, 1, 2. So, here the value will be minus 2 and this 0th sample will go to 3. So, this will be 1. Okay, the next operation is take product of these two sequences x k. So, this is this also is can be taken as k and this is our y 3 minus k this is k this is 2 this is 3 now let us take the product the product is 0 this is also 0 this is 1 times minus 2 that is minus 2 and this is minus 1 times 1 that is minus 1. Then we need to take the sum of these two samples. So, we get minus 2 plus minus 1 equal to minus 3 and that is what we should get as indicated by this. This component is also minus 3. So, we have got minus 3 by graphical method also. So, what have we done? We have taken one sequence, we have flipped it, then we have shifted by 3, 
and then we have multiplied these two sequences to get this and then added all the components of this sequence and that is the value of the convolution at 3. Okay. Then the cyclic convolution is just the same thing except that the flipping operation and the shifting operation both are done cyclically. That is if any component goes outside M, it is brought back to inside cyclically. So, if, the, if anything goes to uh, crosses M minus 1 and goes to M, it is brought back to 0. If it goes to M plus 1, it is brought back to 1 and so on. So, everything is brought back to inside the 0 to M minus 1 range. So, then the other things are exactly same. This shifting, this flipping and this shifting both are taken modulo m. Mathematically cyclic, taking cyclic operation means taking modulo m. You divide by m and then take the, uh, take the remainder. Okay. The cyclic convolution of those two sequences again can be computed uh, either by using linearity just like before for linear convolution or by graphical method in a similar manner. We will not go into the details now. Okay. Now, we will start the uh, OFDM. First of all, let us see why we need OFDM. OFDM is basically a multi carrier modulation meaning by we have a certain bandwidth to be used, we want to use a certain bandwidth for our communication purpose, but we do not want to take a single carrier and then modulate that carrier in some way and transmit. We want to take multiple carriers, we want to divide the band into many small small bands and then take many carriers in one carrier each in each band and then divide the data stream also into many parallel data streams of lower rate and then modulate individual carriers by individual lower rate data streams and then add all the signals and transmits to it, transmit together. So, that we will be using the whole bandwidth, but we will be modulating individual sub carriers, we will call those sub uh, carriers uh, as sub carriers and we will modulate those sub carriers individually by slower data, uh, data, uh, data streams and then add those signals and transmit. So, the advantage here is manifold, we will discuss that in a moment. So, the problems with single carrier modulation is that the frequency selective channels introduce ISI at the receiver, because the channel may not have flat response in the frequency domain and as a result there will be intersymbol interference in the receiver. We have discussed this when, when we uh, discussed equalizer uh, in this course. So, um, the main problem is that the channels are frequency selective. So, they have different attenuation and different frequency. So, that causes intersymbol interference of the receiver if you use single carrier modulation. Also, even if we do equalization at the receiver that does not solve the problem, because by equalization we may actually make the channel flat. We may amplify the regions where uh, the regions in the frequency domain where the attenuation was too much and uh, so on, so that the overall response is flat. But then the noise in those bands will be also amplified to a high extent and that will cause an overall amplification of the noise. The overall noise variance will increase and that is not desired, that will actually create uh, high error probability. So, instead in OFDM what we do is that if there is such a channel like this where there is high frequency selectivity, this part of the channel is very good, this part on the other hand is very bad because there is very high attenuation. Then this is the frequency response of the channel. 
So, in this frequency there is very high attenuation. So, if we instead of using this channel to transmit single carrier modulated signal uh, in which case this needs to be amplified at the receiver in equalization and that causes high amplification of the noise in this band. Instead of doing that if we instead break this frequency into many bands and then transmit uh, very little information in this band and at higher rate in these bands, then this part of the uh, band uh, frequency, this band will not affect our communication much because we will not be using this band so much. We for example, may opt to uh, uh, opt not to communicate, not to use that band at all. So, in that case, there is no amplification of this noise and that does not affect at least the other bands, that is an advantage. And also in each sub band, if we take the sub bands narrow enough, then the equalization becomes very simple in each sub band, because each sub band is narrow and as a result it is almost flat. So, there is no frequency selectivity in each uh, sub band. So, as a result the equalization becomes very simple. Uh, so, that is another advantage. So, in OFDM the spectrum is divided into narrow sub bands, separate data is transmitted in each band using different carriers and power and rate of transmission in different bands may be different. different in different bands we may transmit at different power and at different rates depending on how that channel is, whether it is good or bad. Okay. So, and no ISI since the, uh, since each sub band is narrow and as a result it is almost flat. So, each sub band is narrow and it is almost flat. So, there will not be any ISI and also there will be only an amplification or attenuation and we can take care of that by simply uh, amplifying or attenuating at the receiver. So, so we divide the spectrum in this uh, this kind of bands, sub bands. Let us say that we divide the spectrum in m number of bands. We consider a discrete time situation as we said. So, we uh, consider m symbols that will be transmitted using m number of carriers phi 0 n to phi m minus 1 n are m number of carriers in the time domain. So, that we will be multiplying x naught with this carrier, x 1 with this carrier and so on. So, that we get m separate signals and we will add them and transmit through the channel. So, uh, where is the, where are the sub bands coming? We have m different carriers. Now, the interesting thing is that these uh, carriers will be at different frequency. So, that for example, the first carrier phi naught may be somewhere here, it, it may be it is uh, in the frequency domain the uh, DTFT of that may look like a Fourier transform may look like this somewhere here and the phi 1 may look like uh, will lie here, phi 2 will lie here and so on. So, as a result in this overall signal this component will lie in the first band, this component of the signal will lie in the second band and so on. So, all these components are actually separated in the frequency domain. So, we are transmitting x naught in the first band, x 1 in the second band and so on. So, the block diagram looks like this, x 1 x naught is multiplied by this carrier and then and so on and all these components are added. and the transmitted signal is obtained this way. Now, ideally the carriers should have this kind of spectrum, so that there is no interference between them, there is no inter carrier interference. So, but this is not very practical because to have this kind of spectrum the phi i n should be infinite in time, it should have infinite length because the inverse Fourier transform of this will be sync and that has infinite length. So, this is not practical this is what is desired in the frequency domain, but this is not practical because 
the carriers are infinite length. So, instead of that we want to choose different kind of spectrum, but even then we do not want any intercarrier interference. So, how do we get that? We can still get that provided we ensure that these different phi i's are orthogonal. Even though they overlap in frequency domain, they are still orthogonal. They are not frequency orthogonal, but they are still orthogonal. So, one very popular and probably the only used uh, set of carriers is the DFT carriers. We have discussed the DFT matrix. Now, we take the differ m different rows of the DFT matrix as m sub carriers. So, if we take those uh, this is the ith carrier, we take this to be the ith row of the DFT matrix. This is the ith row of the DFT matrix that we discussed. Uh, instead of DFT we take IDFT because we do not want to take the minus here. Uh, okay. So, if we take the IDFT matrix and take the ith row, we get this basis or uh, this carrier and the, the in the frequency domain this has a spectrum like this, this and then it has some ripples here. So, this, this shows an m equal to 8 case where there are 8 carriers and their spectrums are drawn here separately. Okay. So, now let us see Th these carriers are known to be orthogonal because the DFT matrix is unitary matrix, IDFT matrix is also unitary matrix. So, we can uh, the another important interesting thing here is that this transmitter as we uh, illustrated here can be implemented this part can be implemented in a very simple manner in an efficient manner using FFT. Because this will turn out to be doing DFT and that can be implemented using FFT. So, let us see that. So, this is the signal that we want to transmit, but if we re replace the expression for phi i n that is this then uh, 1 by root n times this then we get this and this is nothing but the IDFT nth IDFT component of the vector x. So, we can simply take the vector x, x 1 to sorry this should be x not to x m minus 1, take the IDFT that is multiplied by d inverse matrix that is IDFT matrix, we will get this signal that is x 0 to x m minus 1 we will get. And then we do parallel to serial conversion and transmit. So, the advantage of implementing it in this fashion is that this IDFT can be implemented using first Fourier transform algorithm which is very efficient. So, this is used in practice very much in all the WebDM technologies that are used. Okay. So, uh, problem, problem is that if we now transmit these blocks. So, we have one set of symbols that we transmit using this, then another set of symbols come, we want to transmit that. Now, if we transmit those blocks one after another, then what will happen is that after the channel is channel impulse response is convolved with that, there will be overlap between the blocks. So, that will cause inter block interference, because see this is the suppose this is the lth symbol. Dip, uh, Lth OFDM symbol x naught to x m minus 1 that is this vector, the Lth vector, and again another vector comes and we get another IDFT vector that is this L plus 1th vector. Then, if we transmit it this way, what will happen is that the linear convolution of this vector with the channel impulse response will have length m, this is the m length m plus L minus 1 where L is the impulse response length, channel impulse response length. If L is the channel impulse response length, then the total length of the convoluted signal is m plus L minus 1. So, now those L minus 1 symbols uh, samples will come and uh, interfere with the next block OFDM block. 
So, this will overlap with the next block and as a result this will spoil these first few samples of the next block. So, this is inter frame or inter block interference and we want to avoid that. How do we avoid that? One way to avoid it is to put some extra zeros after every block. So, if we do that then even after convolution only these zeros will be affected. If we put L minus 1 or more zeros only these zeros will be affected and this block will be untouched even after convolution of this block with the channel impulse response. So, the received signal will not have any ISI, but the rate will of course, be compromised because we are not using some of the uh, samples. We are transmitting 0 samples for L minus 1 uh, samples. So, we are compromising on rate. Another interesting way and that is what is used in practice is the cyclic prefix. Instead of padding some zeros at the end, instead we take the last L minus 1 samples and put it, copy it in the beginning of every block. So, these x naught to x m minus 1 are there, but we take x, min x m minus 1, x m minus 2 and so on till x m minus L plus 1 and put them here, we repeat them in the beginning. So, for the next block also we do the same thing, repeat the last L minus 1 samples in the beginning. So, this is cyclically repeated. So, this is the prefix part of this block. Okay. So, what will happen? In the received symbol, in the received symbol this will be linearly convoluted by the channel impulse response. So, that these will be affected, but then this will not be affected because it will extend only till L minus 1. The effect of the last block will be till only L minus 1. So, this will not be affected. So, we will still have these samples unaffected by the previous block. So, if we remove these circle prefix at the receiver, then this does not have any contribution from the previous block. Only these samples had, but these samples are removed at the receiver. So, this cyclic prefix is discarded at the receiver. Then what is the remaining block? It is also not the linear convolution of the channel impulse response with this block, because linear convolution will also have some extra sim signal coming at the end which is removed. But we can show that this will actually be cyclic convolution, because these extra symbols are repeated cyclically from here. As a result, what we get here will be the cyclic convolution of this block with the channel impulse response, which is denoted by C and here. So, now at the receiver, at the transmitter we did I DFT, at the receiver we will do DFT of this received block. When we do DFT of this received block, we will get by property of convolution property of DFT, we will get the DFT of this times the DFT of this convolution and the time domain becomes point wise multiplication in the frequency domain. So, uh, first at the receiver we remove the cyclic prefix at the transmitter after doing parallel to serial we add cyclic prefix and transmit, then the signal goes to convolution with C n and then here we remove that cyclic prefix part as we discussed and then make it serial to parallel. So, we have m length vector here after removal of cyclic prefix. Then we take FFT that is multiply by D. Then what we get is DFT of X n times DFT of C n. Now, DFT of C n needs to be divided from that product to get DFT of X n. So, we divide by the DFT of the channel impulse response. DFT of channel impulse response first component or uh, 0th component is C naught, first component is C 1 and so on. So, that can be computed and then we divide by those. So, 1 by C naught is multiplied to this and so on. So, we will get the DFT of this vector, the x n sequence which is this because this is the I DFT of this. So, DFT of this is this. So, we will get this back if there is no noise. Of course, if there is noise, there will be a noise component to this, will be added. 
Okay. So, we take DFT of the channel impulse response at the receiver and then divide by the DFT coefficients. Uh, these components are divided by the DFT coefficients of the channel impulse response. So, this is the transceiver structure of the OFDM system and here you see that how nicely the properties of DFT are used, especially the cyclic um, convolution property. Okay. And uh, one can see that if a channel is bad, for example, if C 1 is very high, uh, C 1 is very low, then what will, uh, if the channel impulse response in the frequency domain is very low, that is C 1 is very low, then this will be very high, this quantity will be very high. So, as a result, this noise component in this branch will be multiplied by a high number. So, as a result the noise component added to this will be large and as a result this will have low SNR. So, some channels are good, some channels are bad depending on the magnitude of these components. So, how do we, uh, how much do we use the different channels? To what extent do we use different channels? The channel which is good we want to use that channel to a greater extent than the channels which are bad. So, uh, if you want to do it in optimum way, this is the way we can derive that this is the way to go. If this is a band, this is the, uh, if you plot this quantity, the sigma square is the noise variance, then uh, plot sigma square by C i mod C i square. So, in the ith sub channel, C i square, C i is the DFT coefficient, ith DFT coefficient of the channel impulse response, then sigma square by mod C i square is basically proportional to the inverse of the impulse uh, frequency response of the channel. Then it is like this, we take the total power p that we have and we imagine a container with this shape of the bottom and we pour the power in the vessel of this shape. Then when the p, the total amount of p which is behaving like water is finished, we stop and we measure the height of the power level in each sub channel and that is the power we transmit through that sub channel. So, this is called water pouring solution for power allocation. So, we, we can compute the power that is to be transmitted through each sub channel in this fashion and then to com compute how many bits should be transmitted through each sub channel, what we can do is we can first decide uh, what is the probability of error that we want, then we have some SNR because the power that is to be transmitted is obtained from water pouring solution and the noise vari variance is also known. So, we can compute SNR and we have some required probability of error, then we can decide on a number of bits and the constellation that we want to use can be chosen. So, in this class we have discussed OFDM technique, we have first revised some uh, basics of digital uh, signals and systems and discuss DFT and its properties in to some detail. And then we have seen how the, proper, the properties of DFT, especially the convolution property is used very efficiently in an OFDM system and that simplifies the OFDM implementation to a great extent. First of all, the trans transmitter and receiver is implemented using FFT, which is very efficient algorithm and also the equalization becomes very simple by using cyclic prefix. There is no interference between subcarriers and the equalization is very simple, just divide by the channel uh, frequency response, divide by C i. So, that is how we see that OFDM is simple simply implemented using DFT techniques. Thank you.